Good Monday, everyone. Hope you had a relaxing weekend, maybe? Oh, yeah, the giant one. The giant one? Wow, weird. <laughs> Not that weird that they won. It's weird that we have giants today. Cardinals almost won, so that's nice. Cool, some things we don't want to talk about. Okay, I understand. <laughs> I'm a 49er fan, so I feel like All right, cool. So before we get started, today we're going to talk about calculating first sets. And I think we're going to be able to get into calculating follow sets, which as you all know, because you reviewed Project 3's description, this is core to Project 3. And to further motivate you, into how important Project 3 is, and to start early, these are the scores from last semester of everybody's Project 3. Um, so you can see there's actually a good amount of people who did, got over 100%, there's a little bit of extra credit if you read the grading there carefully. Um, but you can see how quickly it goes down. <laughs> just a page on the note taking page. <laughs> the line doesn't mean anything. And it goes, oh. Oh. I don't want this to be you. This is why I want you to start now. So you're going to be all good. You're going to start early. You're going to come to office hours. You're going to come to undergrad TA hours. You're going to come to recitation sections. And you're going to destroy this project in a good way. Some other statistics, so if you want to see it in a... So here's kind of the distribution. It's got this kind of weird... Right, these are just all the grades plotted highest to lowest, kind of on a scatter plot here. So which end do you want to be in? The left. The left end. Yeah. All right, to further break it down, I got some stats. The average is 53.9%. And so you think, well, there's a ton of zeros here, right? And actually, some of those people withdrew from the class or weren't involved or whatever. And so even taking out those zeros, the average is still 67.39%. And then I dug down some more. Um, and I figured out, based on people's final grades, what was the average of what they got. So. Um, people who got an A minus or higher, the average was 101%, which makes sense, right? You get 105% on this project, it's a lot easier to get an A in the class. Uh, the B's were, the average was 70%, the C's, the average was 38, and the not passing grades were 14%. So this is also why this sets you up very good for the next rest of the semester, because a good grade in Project 3 makes it a lot easier to pass the class and do really well. So questions on this and the importance of Project 3? I won't take individual like Project 3 description questions. That's going to happen in recitation sections. Yeah. Slightly related. Do you give A pluses? Uh, yes, but you have to score very high. I think five students got it last semester out of 126 or something like that. So yeah. Um, I think it's on the website, right, on the syllabus? It's like over 97%. It's hard to get. Any other questions? I saw there was like another hand over there. Yeah? Do you think the only, two, the only reason people did so poorly was because they ran out of time? Some people, yes. Uh, it's a variety of reasons. Some people definitely ran out of time. Like there's people who came to me and talked to me and said that they ran out of time on Project 3 and that's why they did so poorly on it. So. Um, this, that's definitely part of it. Another thing is people, um, you have to kind of fight that feeling of not getting help. So starting early helps because you get stuck and then you go get help getting unstuck and then you keep going. Um, so that's why I encourage people to come to office hours and do all that stuff because uh, it can definitely help you. We can help get you on the right track if you're getting on the wrong track. But if you just like sit in your room or in the lab or whatever working on it and don't get any help from anyone and just are stuck for days at a time and you're having a tough time. Yeah? Something I've been wondering about uh, with the first two projects as well is 
we are able to get it all up and running, and then we submit it, and then we get some immediate feedback from the system. Yes. But it does, I'm assuming our grade is also based on the actual source code that we submitted. If somebody's going to be going through it and looking to make sure that we like implemented our own link list, things like that. Like is for that project two, yes, we're going to be looking at your code. Uh, it's only going to adjust your grade very slightly, but we want to give you feedback on what you're doing well or not well. Um, but for projects, for the rest of the projects, we're really treating this kind of as an input-output project. So I don't care how you implement it from here on out. Um, basically, projects one and two are to get you developing the skills that you need to be successful on projects three, four, and five. And that's why we do things like make you make linked lists with straps. Because in project five, you have to do that a lot. Or to find bugs in projects, which I know these bugs in these projects are going to happen in three, four, and five. Or doing code coverage and learning how to debug code, all those kinds of things will help you. Um, so that's why, yeah, from here on out, it's going to be there's a long specification. You have to understand and interpret that specification. The specification has very specific input output um, requirements. And so if you satisfy those, you're all good. If you don't, you don't get credit. So if you give me a thousand lines of code that don't work and don't pass any test cases and don't compile, it's still a zero. Yeah. Um, usually, what's the low end? Uh, what project do people score low end on? Like that? I don't know. It's actually hard to tell uh, because people find after this project they withdraw. So by the time project five comes around, um, some of the people are gone that didn't do well on projects three or four who may not do well on project five. Uh, but there are still people who, I looked it up, some people passed uh, with a zero on project three. So it's definitely possible depending how you do in the other ones. Um, anecdotally from students, I've heard some people think project three is the hardest. Some people think project five is the hardest. It all kind of depends on the person, I think. <laughs> Any other questions? So the good news, this isn't just to scare you, right? The good news is this chunk at the top, right? It's possible, and you can do it. I, I'm not going to curve it or anything. If it comes out that all of you get 105 besides looking for academic integrity violations, I'll be super stoked. Because I don't want to, I don't give out any zeros. All right, I don't want you to get a zero, but you know we got to set standards. Yeah, it's, it's probably the document, but it'll be same automated system like all of our code instant feedback on this project. Yep. It's already up there now, so, so everything's good for you to go. Cool. Anything else, briefly? So we got to get to this stuff if you're able to do this project. Okay. All right, so last week on Friday, we started out basically developing our own intuition of first sets. And we, so what are first sets? So from an input-output functional standpoint, what is, what is a first set? What's the input? Yeah. It tells us the terminal or terminals that a context-free grammar can begin with. Yes. More specifically, what's the input to a first set? A bunch of tokens. What kind of tokens? A sequence of terminal and non-terminal. Yes, a sequence of terminal and non-terminal, right? Exactly. So like this alpha represents a sequence of terminals and non-terminals. And then so what's the output? A set of, what's it around? Terminals on non-terminals. Terminals? It can't ever be non-terminals, right? Because you can't have a string start with a non-terminal, right? Because every non-terminal is going to be broken down eventually into terminals. So it's going to be set in terminals and what? And possibly epsilon. And possibly epsilon, exactly. Cool. So we have a function. We're taking in a list, a sequence of terminals and non-terminals, and it's going to output either uh, it's going to output a set containing terminals or non-terminals. And the set, I guess. Could it ever be empty? I don't know. Maybe. It's interesting. OK. All right, so we saw and why. So the very first part of this process, right, of this calculation is we start out with empty first sets for all non-terminals in the grammar. So why do we do this? It's a hack, because if you do it the other way, there's no possible, or there's no guarantee that you're going to actually be successful. So I would argue it's not a hack, but yes. It depends on the way 
how you're using hack. If you mean like a cool hack, then yes. Um, it's just a way of starting the algorithm, right? So we start with knowing nothing, right? We know nothing. So that this way we don't have to worry about recursive of first set of this, is first set of this, is first set of this. No, we just start with the first set of all non-terminals in the grammar is the empty set. So we start with that, and then we go through, in this case we care about the non-terminals, so we're gonna apply these following five rules that we derived on Friday, and we're gonna apply them for every non-terminal in the grammar, and we're gonna do this until the first sets don't change. So what was, somebody give me a rule, it could be the first rule or not. Think of the base cases. So what are the base cases of these calculating first sets? So wait, so, oh, so terminal. So yeah, so what's the first set of a terminal? It's all the domain. Yeah, the set containing that terminal. Exactly, so this should be the first rule. So the first set of x, if x is a terminal, is the set containing x, right? First rule, it makes sense. Terminal, it stops. Cool, what about the other case? So what's the other base case condition? Epsilon. No. Epsilon, yeah, so if we have a rule, so it's that. All right, so the first of epsilon is the set containing epsilon, right? All right. Then we have our three rules. So these are, when you think of it as a, you know, these are the base cases here. It's either gonna be an, uh, a terminal or an epsilon. And then we have to say, okay, how do we pull apart this alpha, right? Alpha is gonna be a sequence of terminals and non-terminals. So we have, so this is slightly different than the way we looked at it before, but it's basically the same. So we have, uh, if we have a production rule, A produces B alpha, right? So alpha here, sequence of terminals, non-terminals. If it's a production rule, then add the first of B minus epsilon to first of A. Right? So what does this say kind of in English, if you were to translate this? We know there's an epsilon in B. We don't. We only want to add the first of A to the first of B if there was an epsilon in B. So what this says is we add the first of B. So we take the first symbol on the left hand on the right hand side. So the leftmost symbol on the right hand side, calculate its first set, subtract epsilon and then add that to the first of A. I was, I was reading that as first of alpha. Uh, this one? Yes. Yeah, so we don't even worry about alpha in, in this case. We just say for everything, right? For every rule that's in this form, we always do this. We add the first of B to the first, the first of B minus epsilon to the first of A. So then do we care if there's an epsilon in first of B? Yes. Why? Yeah, but that's the next rule. So we don't have to worry about that. Just for this rule. So you're talking about going ahead too much. For this rule, do we care if there's an epsilon in the first of B? No, for this one we don't care. We just know we always have to take out epsilon, right? If it's there, we take it out. If it's not there, then we leave it as it is, right? We're doing set difference here. And so we add that, and we're talking about sets, so when we add it to a set, right? It's gonna add it to the first of A. Cool. Now we have to deal with the case of what if there is an epsilon in the first of B? All right, so it's gonna look complicated. And, but it's not, well, once we pull it apart, now I'm just doing this to freak out. Um, so we know intuitively, right? So what do we know? So if there's epsilon in the first of B, then what do we do? For first of alpha, right, we'd add the first of alpha to first of A. Right? So this is just saying, okay, let's pick apart alpha, and let's say alpha is composed of B's from index zero to I, and then from I to K. Right? So all this means is, let's say there's epsilon in 
the first of B0, B1, B2, all the way up to BI, right? So the I's represent epsilons. They're going to be epsilon in all those first sets. Then we add the next one, first of BI plus 1 minus epsilon to the first of A. So add the next one. Right, so we have B0 through BI, if there's epsilon in all those first sets. Then we add first of B I plus one minus epsilon. So what does this say about B I plus one, the first set of B I plus one? Does it? Yeah, so that's the important thing to note about the way we write this rule. All we're saying that must have epsilon in it is B0 through BI. We're not saying anything about what comes after it. What we're saying is we take the first set of whatever comes after it minus epsilon from it and add it to the first of A. But we don't have to worry about BI plus 1. And so, if you think about it, in this case, let's assume there is epsilon in B0 through I. Does this apply with, let's say, i is equal to 1? Or I, let's say i equals 0. So if i is equal to 0, is there an epsilon in first of b0? Assuming this is true? Yes. Yes, right, it has to be. So then what should we add to the first of a? the first of B1 minus epsilon to the first of A. And then we would say, is epsilon in the first of B0 and the first of B1? In this case, yes. Then add the first of B2 minus epsilon to the first of A. So you see how this definition essentially allows us to iterate over all of the elements of alpha from zero all the way to the end and says this applies for all, if there's epsilon in the first of the, that symbol, you can move on to the next one. Yeah? So I, I see the logic, so basically we'll go through each one, check if there's an epsilon, and it goes until there, there's one that doesn't have an epsilon? Exactly, yeah. As soon as this, this is false, where we get to some d uh, in between i and k, let's uh, j, to some j that does not have an epsilon in its first set, then we don't go any further. Because this condition no longer holds. What about if none of them have an epsilon? Then it doesn't hold. Right? You don't have an epsilon in the first one, none of this applies. Okay. So the fifth case, so what is, when we developed it, our intuition, what does the fifth case take care of? They all have epsilon. They all have epsilon. Yeah, what happens if every single token here, terminal, non-terminal, well, it won't be a terminal in this case, but every single non-terminal has epsilon in its first set. Then we add epsilon to first of A. So if throughout all the symbols, so when you think about this programmatically, right, what you're doing is you're saying the third rule says you always take the first symbol here, whatever it is, add the first of that to the first of A, or the first of that minus epsilon to the first of A. And then you say, is there an epsilon in that B0's first set? If there is, then add the next ones minus epsilon to the first of A, and then check that. Is there an epsilon in there? If it is, add the next one. And you go through, and if you went through every single symbol on the right-hand side, there is epsilon in all those first sets, the fifth rule applies, and you add epsilon. Questions on the formalism, the formal rules, and the linkage to the intuition we talked about on Friday? They're pretty, I mean, they're basically exactly the same. This is just more formally defined and a little bit more concise. All right, example time? Example time. All right, let's go walk through an example of calculating first sets. So we have a grammar, S goes to A, B, C, D. A goes to C, D, or little a, big A. 
B goes to little b, C goes to little c, big c, or epsilon, D goes to little d, big d, or epsilon. All right. So we're going to do just like we did when we were calculating these by hand. I mean, we're still going to calculate these by hand, but even with the rules, we're going to basically make a table and say, well, that's weird. Okay. We're not going to say that at the start. We're going to first initialize the first sets of all non-terminals in the grammar to the empty set. S, A, B, C, D. Right? That's how we start. It's exactly how your program should start. So you don't have to do it now because we're talking about how to calculate this. So calculating this by hand is critical, right? You can't write a program to do this if you don't know how to do it yourself. Seems an obvious statement, but you know, that's important. But later on, when you come back to this and you're thinking about how to program this, you should think about what things do I need to implement this in my program, right? Based on this like mathematical algorithm, right? Like, hmm, I must have some ways to distinguish between terminals and non-terminals. I have some ways to represent epsilon. I need to represent things as sets, so I need to have a set class and know how to do set operations. I need to have a set difference operation to subtract out epsilon. I need to be able to add one set to another set. Yeah? Do we have to implement the disjoint set library ourselves, or can we use an existing one? Uh, you can use. You're pretty much free to use whatever you want as long as it's not anybody else's code. I mean, <laughs> in here's code, or in previous years. So all the CS330 or 340 students stretching back in time. Um, yeah, you're free to use whatever. You, know, you have to get it to compile and run and on that operating system. Uh, but yeah, if you can, whatever's built into the uh, C++ standard library, you're welcome to use. You can even use third-party libraries if you want, as long as you include them in your code. All that stuff's good to go. Thank you. It's difficult enough as is without writing. I mean, you could do this. I, I mean, well, like people do it in C without sets. You can do some basic set operations yourself in C. You just have to do a little more work. So, anyways, okay. So we go through, and then we say we're calculating first of S. So which rule applies? Is S a terminal? It's a terminal? No. Oh, so the rule one doesn't apply? Is it epsilon? No. Nope. Rule two doesn't apply? Are there any rules with S on the left hand side where we have S goes to something? Um, just the one. Yeah, just the one. Perfect. So then we have rule three, which says that if we have this production rule, so the other way to look at this is when you're calculating the first of S, you go through the rules where S is on the left hand side. Right? That's what you're looking for, and only looking at those rules. We don't care, for calculating first of S, we don't care about any of this, anything else. We only look at the rules where S is on the left-hand side. OK. So then we take the, so what's the leftmost symbol on the right-hand side of this rule? A. A, so what's the first A? Empty set, perfect. Empty set minus epsilon is the empty set. And we add that to the first of S, which is the empty set. Yay. No progress made. <laughs> All right. Then we look at A. So we want to calculate first of A. So we know A is not an terminal, not epsilon. So in rule three, we want to check if that applies. So if A goes to B alpha, then we add the first of the leftmost symbol on the right-hand side. So what do we have to pick first? Is the is alpha in this case C D bar little a big A? No, right? The important thing to remember is that bar is just shorthand for two rules. A goes to C D and A goes to little a big A. Okay. So we first, well, so we first add, well, okay, let's see. We first add little, uh, the first set of C, which is empty set to the minus epsilon to the first of A, which doesn't change it. And then we look at the next rule. And then we would also say, is epsilon in the first set of C? No, so we don't move on. Then we look at the next rule and say, OK, we take the first of this leftmost symbol. The leftmost symbol is little a, so it is the first of uh, the second thing A. So the first of A right now is the second thing A. 
Cool. All right. First to B. What's it going to be? Second thing, little B. Yay. Cool. All right. First of C. So it'll be by rule three, it'll be C, right? We have this little C. And then by rule two, with the other rule, it'll be epsilon, right? So we'll have C epsilon here. And what about for D? D epsilon. Yeah, D epsilon, the same thing. Cool. Are we done? No. We go home? Is that because there's three more columns to do? That helps. It does help. There won't be that on any midterms or anything, so. Yeah, but we know, we can see, we made a change, right? Cool. Yeah, if we put the chart on the midterm, so we'd have to draw our own. It'd be easier to grade that way. Uh, but then I would tell you, I would be really mean and give you a super large chart. <laughs> just to mess with you. Um, it's actually not that hard to grade these, because you just have like curly braces with an arrow. and It's easy to see when you mess up. I mean, if. All right. First of S now, so we go again through our rules. So we say rule three applies, so we add the first of A, which is second to A, and then there's no epsilon in the first of A, so we stop, we don't move on anymore. Cool. So now we do first of A, so now we Look at this rule, and we say, okay, first of C minus epsilon, add that to first of A. So now first of A will have C, little c. And then do we get to move on? So now rule four applies, because there's an epsilon in the first of C. So now we add the first of D minus epsilon to the first of A, which is going to be little d. So now we have little a, or little c, little d. And then do we add the next thing after D? Does rule four apply again? Yeah. Right, there is nothing after, right? So it doesn't make sense to talk about adding the next thing afterwards. Right, so there is no I plus one here. It's only, we've reached the end. But then we have rule five. Right, and so do all the symbols in the right hand side of this rule have epsilon in the first set? Yes, epsilon, epsilon, so then we add epsilon to the first of A. And then we would go and check this other rule and add the first of little a to the first of big A. So we have C, D, epsilon, little a, which I guess all the rules are here. A, C, D, epsilon. And you can actually do this whichever way you want. You can start with because you're only ever adding information here. So you could start with the second containing A and then add C, D, epsilon, and then add A back in. Or you can even start with the empty set, and this could be a good self-check that you better have what you had before in it in the next step. Otherwise, you calculated something wrong. All right. First of B is going to remain the same. First of C is also going to remain the same. First of D is going to remain the same. Are we done? No. So you see it's kind of cool, like the information is kind of propagating throughout all of these first sets based on the rules and their relationships and how they appear in the grammar. Right, so like before, well, when we got to C, uh, when we got to A, we didn't know anything about C and D, so we didn't get that much information. But now that we know more about C and D, we can understand that, oh, actually the first of A can be a lot of things, A, C, D, and epsilon. And, as probably as you can see here, this is going to impact S and change what we do with S. Okay. So first of S, we do rule number three, and we say we add the first of A minus epsilon to S, so this is going to add ACD. And then, do we go on? Does rule four apply? Yes, so what, what's first set do I add? B, so there is an epsilon in the first of A, so I add the first of B minus epsilon to S, so this is going to be B, and then do I apply rule 4 again and add the first of C? No, 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 no,
right? So A can go to C, D, and both of those can go to nothing. So there is a chance that A, that this A basically disappears and doesn't produce anything in the resulting string. But this capital B will always produce this lowercase b, right? So strings that S generate have to at least start with either an A, C, D, or B. Uh, we can do a first of A again, we'll see that it's the same. We'll do first of B, C, and D. Those are the same. Are we done? No, we got more information about first of S. <coughs> right? So we run through it again, and we'll see that they change they don't change. And then we say, are we done? Yes, we are done. This is the first set of every grammar in our language. Questions on this? So there's two really cool things about, that I like about this. A, I mean, you can practice it by hand, but it's mechanical, right? And you're just applying an algorithm, doing a process. And this is why you can write a program that can do this exact same thing. So it doesn't matter how this grammar looks like or what this grammar does, you can still calculate first sets for every non terminal of the grammar. Yeah? Does it always stop down? Or can it be bottom? Oh. Say that again? Is it always going to be like top down? Like, so we have to work out first S, first and then A, and then B. Oh, you mean which, which non terminal do you start with? Yeah. Doesn't matter. So if you start with, like, for example, D, then C, then B, then A, then S, would you have like a different, uh, like, you'll get to the end quicker? Yeah, it would uh, converge quicker, right? Where we get to this point where we're not adding any more information. In this specific case, it will, but not in every case. Right. Um, so that's why it doesn't, you know. It, Really doesn't matter. I just like always starting kind of in the order that the non terminals are in. It's a little bit easier to read and understand that way. Gotcha. I think you want to make test questions where going the wrong way would make, take, make it take longer. It's interesting. Cool. Any other questions on first sets? Sweet. Okay. So why were we trying to calculate first sets in the first place? Project 3. Why are we doing first sets for Project 3? So we could do well on it and pass the class. <laughs> All true things. <laughs> so we could determine if the sequence Five of feet. tokens was syntactically accurate. Yeah, going back, right? We wanted to be able to see what's going that depressing graph. Right? The whole reason why we wanted to talk about these is so that when we're in the situation of S goes to, let's say, A or B, right? And we have that A goes to, I don't know, A or C, and B goes to little b, big B, or epsilon or something, right? So why do we want this? So then we can decide which rule yeah, we need to decide which rule. So what do we use? So now we have the first set. So we have the first set of, uh, let's see, S, A, and B. And A is going to be A, C. B is going to be B, Epsilon. And so S will be A, C, B, Epsilon. So why can we always tell in this specific example, why can I always choose if I read one token or one terminal, why can I choose if I'm parsing an A or parsing a B? So can you choose? Let's go with that. So let's say, go back to how we're writing the parse S method, right? I go T type. get token, right? So now what do I check? How do I know if I should call parse A? If it's in the first of A? Yeah, or what? Or C, right? Because we got A goes to A or C. So if T type, I'm gonna make really terrible syntax, is A or C. 
I should write a language so that I can do this. Right? Then I do this. So I know basically this is the rule S goes to A produce this output. And what else am I checking? Was it? B? Yeah. If the, so let's say there was, let's say I changed this grammar to be like this, and this was the first sentence. Now can I tell by looking at one character? No. No. So then how can I use the first right sets to create a rule that says if I know the first sets of all non-terminal in the grammar, I can say that I can always distinguish between these rules. So what is it about the first sets of A and B? Yeah, there's no element in common of their first sets, right? So something like, I'm going to get rid of all this. I don't have to need this right now. Yeah, why is the reason so slow? Right? So you say, like, if I have a rule, uh, S goes to alpha, and S goes to beta. Right? So if the first of alpha you, uh, intersect, with, intersect with the first of beta, should be y. It's equal to the empty set. Yeah, exactly. Right? This means that if I take both the elements in common to both sets, there should be none. No elements in common. Right? This way I can actually tell which one should go. Does that make sense? Cool. We're going to come back to this later. But remember, we just invented this. All right. Is it like if we if the intersection is not null and not phi, then we can't parse it? Correct. Well, we can't parse it efficiently, right? We can always do the incredibly um, brute force way of parsing it and try every possible combination. Um, so yeah, we can try parsing it with A and then try parsing it with B if that failed and then uh, then say either it could be parsed or it could not be parsed. But uh, to parse it efficiently by only looking at one token in advance, uh, which is where we're going with all of this. So it's predicted recursive descent parsers, but we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but I want to build up a little bit before we talk about follow sets. I need to talk about why we need follow sets. And so this is kind of where we're leaving here. Uh, can, can we look at one or more uh, next uh, terminals and decide? Say that again? Yeah. Currently, we are looking at only one single. Correct. Right? Can we increase the window and maybe then we can decide which production to use? I think in general, yes. But then, like, Calculating second is a lot more difficult than just calculating first. Um, so for right now, we're just focusing on specific types of grammars that we can easily distinguish based on one token. Uh, but yeah, there's you know there's infinite types of grammars. So yeah, there's grammars where you could look two tokens, or three tokens, or four tokens. Uh, but we're trying to avoid that. General compilers have only one token. Say it again. Normal compilers. C or whatever. They have only one look ahead or they have multiple look ahead? Depends on the specific language. Uh, uh, we'll actually see an example that's taken from real um, parsing, so I'll, I'll share that with you in a second. Um, it's a good question, though. I should look up. I'll bring my C book. Does anybody have that uh, C book that I recommended? You have it? Okay, maybe later. But in the back of that book, it has the whole context free grammar of the C language. So everything that you need in there. And I don't know whether it's this way or not, but it's interesting. Probably, yeah. Um, I have a question about like, the thing that we just did earlier. First sets? The table. Sure. Yeah. Um, where's the part we have? There we go. There we go. So for example, say B actually was like B and epsilon. Mm -hmm. uh, with, the, with S and an epsilon, since because like we already have C and D, like we won't point to the next like C or D because we already have it, or would it actually so you can store C and then D again? You would do it again. So you would so if there was yeah, so if there's B or epsilon here, 
you would add the first of A minus epsilon to the first of S. And you'd say, is there an epsilon in the first of A? Yes. So you add the first of B minus epsilon to the first of S. And then you'd say, is there an epsilon in the first of B? Yes. Then you'd say, then add the first of C minus epsilon to the first of S. Is there an epsilon in the first of C? Yes. Then add the first of D minus epsilon to the first of S. Yes. And then you'd say, is there an epsilon in all these symbols? Yes. Then finally add epsilon. So how would S uh, end up looking like? I think it would be the same, but with epsilon. Oh, so, so it'll just say A, C, D, D, and then epsilon? Yeah. Oh, so the, the, the epsilon won't point like at the C after that again, because it just stops it since we already have C and D already in the thing? No, no, it doesn't stop anywhere. So it only, um, the fact that A can go to C, D basically means that C and D's first sets are already in the first of A, which means when we add them to first of S, so really, we're not adding any additional information by doing this. But in general, you don't know that for certain, so you should just do it every time. Right. And because that information is already there, you're not changing the first of S. Oh, OK, gotcha. So we don't just keep adding. Huh. Right. You're, so you're just adding its set, its set union and set, right? So you're adding it to this set. You can't have more elements of a certain thing in the set. So awesome. Cool. Okay, let's use this as an example first. Is this right? Is this what I want? So first of A. A, cool. First of B. B epsilon. Oh, this still doesn't show exactly what I want to show. Okay, so by our first rule, right, so our rule here. So there's S goes to A or S goes to B. So is there an intersection between these first sets? No. And okay, let's think. So if I have an A, I have S goes to A here. So do I actually know that this A came from here? So parse S, I can parse S, S goes to A, little b, big b, little a. Hmm. So can I tell? So if I get an A, get token as an A, should it always be parse A? B is a little b. 
Say it again. You raised it. Erased a little bit. Oh, this definitely wouldn't, but then this changes the first sets, right? The first set, so actually this is a good example. Um, all right, let's start below here. So I have old S, A, B. Okay, so I start out with all empty sets, all right, let's start with B, let's start from the bottom. Okay, so I apply rule three to this rule, B goes to big B little A, and so then I say add the first of B to the first of B, or first of B minus epsilon to the first of B, what's the first set of B? Empty set, yeah, empty set minus there's an empty set, do I move on and add first of A? Not yet, because there is no epsilon in first of A, or first of B. Exactly. Cool. Then I add here, so this gives me epsilon. Then I add first of A, so by rule one, that's going to give me first set containing A, and then S. So A is going to give me A, and B is going to give me epsilon. So let's think about exactly how this happens, right? So I have A epsilon. Right? Let's, let's think about exactly how this happens. Right? And it's important to think this way because this is the way your program should operate. Right? So by rule 3, we have the rule S goes to B. So by rule 3, it should have the first of B what? Minus epsilon. So the first of B minus epsilon to S. So the first set of B is the second containing epsilon. So we take out epsilon, it's the empty set. So we add the empty set to S. So where did this epsilon and S come from? The fact that it was the last thing that it was yeah, rule five, right? So we say, does rule four apply? Well, there's nothing after it, so it can't apply. But then we say, okay, rule five. Is there epsilon in the first sets of all symbols here? Yes, there is. Then we add epsilon to the first set of S, right? And this is an important distinction because when you're doing this mentally, it's clear that the first set of this S goes to B means we add epsilon to the first of S, right? But it's important to understand how exactly that happens by precisely using our rules so that when you program it, you can make sure that this is happening in the same way. Cool. Okay, we're not done. Let's start again at B. So now I add the first of B minus epsilon to the first of B. So the first of B is second containing epsilon, so we add the empty set, but then I say rule four. Does rule four apply? Yeah, so we add the next one, the first of the next thing, to the first of B. So what's the first, the next thing after it? A, so we're gonna add A, and so we say, does rule four apply again? No, because there's no epsilon here, and there's nothing after it. Does rule five apply? Here? Is there epsilon in the first sets of all the symbols of this right hand rule? No, yeah. Why did you put rule five when we know that A is a domain rule? We're just being thorough. <coughs> did you start going from the bottom up just because of the conversation yep. we had earlier? Yep. Okay. Just because. And so B goes to epsilon, adds epsilon. Yeah, there's no difference. You can start in whatever order you want. A is still going to be A. S is going to be A, which is A. B, which is also A. And epsilon. So. Can we distinguish between S goes to A or B by those two rules? Right, because there's the first of A is A and the first of epsilon is A epsilon. Right, so this is, um, so we actually can't, so this grammar we'll see is not predictive. Cool, all right, we'll stop here, this is a good starting point. On Wednesday we'll tackle follow sets, that would be awesome.